So I'm going to start off with uh, four rules. And I like uh, one of the rules uh, that you gave, Dennis, that um, start young to learn languages. And I started quite young when I was in uh, Canada. I grew up in Canada. I was born there. And I was forced to learn French. And I didn't know why I needed French. And I didn't put a lot of effort into it. And so language became a very um, difficult uh, thing in my life. I needed it to graduate. I needed to get a passing grade to graduate, but uh, French was, and I loved reading the classics. I learned to read French and I loved reading the classics. But when I got up to speak and do a presentation in front of the class, my French teacher who was from Paris, France would stand beside me and hold her ears and say, oh, my French ear, it hurts. My French ear, it hurts. <laughs> so I was not motivated to continue learning language. But my family moved to, uh, well, before we get started, I have to give this background. Um, so my fam when I was in my senior year of high school, my family moved to California and I still needed language to graduate. And I thought, well, it's not gonna be French, that's for sure. <laughs> and why not Spanish? Well, I struggled through Spanish with the same kind of difficulty. I was not immersed in the language. I was taking a couple of hours a week, uh, classroom Spanish, learning to read, not learning to speak. I got enough under my belt to pass the test. I graduated and I was done with language. English was the language for me. So, why do I mention that I have four rules for travel, for successful travel? Well, I have traveled quite a bit in my life. And I've learned that it's very important to learn the language of the country where you travel, even if it's only a few words. But here's my approach. <laughs> First of all, uh, soon after my husband and I got married, I, we went to Nicaragua, where we lived for almost 11 years. We did not know Spanish when we arrived. We learned Spanish. My husband had classes at Citibank where he worked. They gave him a free Spanish teacher every morning. Meanwhile, I'm home with three young children and a maid who speaks Spanish only. And that's how I learned Spanish. I learned it by talking to my maid and then talking to my neighbors, talking to the teachers of my children. I threw them into Spanish school, uh, Nicaraguan schools, not American schools. I knew my children would learn easily. It was not so easy for me, but it was by necessity. It was what they call the immersion method, I believe. <laughs> I had to learn Spanish to survive and I did. A few years later, my husband got a job in Haiti we moved to Haiti and guess what? They didn't speak Spanish there. They spoke French and Haitian Creole. And there again, I was challenged to learn the language of the country where I was living. And I did. I learned to speak and read and write. And for me, that was the best way to learn. Now, I am not, uh, I don't know these languages from an academic point of view, but I do know the language enough to make friends and uh, participate fully in the life of the people of the country where I'm living. And those were very positive experiences for me. But then what happened? Many years later, <laughs> about 12 years ago, I went to China. Now, my second language for successful travel is you should have a plan. Now I went to China 12 years ago because I was invited by a longtime friend, uh, American who had lived in, had been living in China for many years and loved China. And she says, please come and visit me in China. Up until that point, I had no intention of going to China. I knew very little about China. I was a mystery country to me, I but I knew very little except what I saw in old movies like many people in the West. But I said, sure, I'd love to come and see you. And um, after I arrived, um, she introduced me to a lot of different people. And these people, Chinese people, invited me to visit them 
in their homes, in their cities. So I got to travel uh, quite a bit, taken literally by the hand with people who spoke both English and Chinese because I did not speak one word of Chinese. I could barely say ni hao at the time. But I was falling in love with the people. They were warm-hearted, kind, friendly, happy people, energetic. I loved the people immensely. And I so wanted to be able to communicate with them. I, and I wanted to live there. How I was going to do that, how I was going to support myself while I did that, I did not know. I did not have a plan. But I did go to China. I, I had to go home. My visa was up. I went home for three months. I got another tourist visa. I went back to China with the idea that I'm going to find a job. <laughs> I didn't have any connection. So my other rule is don't go alone to the home of a stranger. This is a very good rule. It was a rule that my mother taught me when I was quite young. And why is this an important rule? Well, there I was in Chongqing. I decided Chongqing was going to be the city where I was going to live in China. I was uh, staying in, temporarily in the home of an American lady. I was sleeping on her couch. I needed to find a place to live. I needed to learn the language, and uh, but how? She So the first day that I'm in Chongqing, she goes off to teach her English class at the university. We were living on campus with special permission for me to spend uh, uh, some a few days on her couch. And uh, I ventured forth alone into a shopping area in Chongqing, in the heart of Chongqing. I was immediately overwhelmed with the noise and the sights and the sounds and the smells and the language. I couldn't understand, I couldn't speak, I couldn't read. I panicked, what am I going to do? I actually ran back to her flat, took a, an hour or so, calmed down, what am I going to do? I'm here to learn the culture, to get to know the people, eventually learn the language. I need to go back out there and meet people. I had no connections. <laughs> I had no job. I was there on a tourist visa. I went back out to the shopping area and I stood alone in the middle of this square, surrounded by thousands of people. Chongqing is a very, very crowded city. You are shoulder to shoulder with hundreds if not thousands of people. And I just standing there looking bewildered. And then what did I see? This storefront, Xinhua Bookstore, oh, English. I ran into the bookstore and I wildly gestured like this, book, book, English, English. <laughs> the woman kind of figured out that, okay, okay go there, go there. And off I went in the direction she pointed. And yes, they had a corner devoted to selling English books. And there were some students there who were learning English, some university students. I asked them if they knew of a book called The Three Kingdoms. They probably did know about this book because that's required reading in China, but they didn't understand the English title and I didn't know it in Chinese. Fortunately, there was an older gentleman standing to the side and he saw me trying to um, get help from these young people and he came over and he said can I help you in pretty good English I said yes you can <laughs> and I told him what I was looking for and he checked with the manager of the store and said yes this book is available but not here this is a branch you have to go downtown to get the book but I will go downtown and get this book for you I said oh no no you see, I'm American, I'm independent, I'm North American, and I can do things for myself. So I said, oh, that's okay, I will do it myself. He looked very sad and said, oh, well, all right, but is there anything else I can do for you? And I said, yes, I want to learn Chinese. <laughs> he jumped up, and literally, he jumped up and down and smiling, and he said, I know a Chinese teacher, I will introduce you. So we exchanged phone numbers, he said, I'll call you tomorrow. Is there anything else I can do for you? I said, well, actually I need to find a place to live. Oh, I can help you with that. I know someone who can, will help you find a place to rent. I will call you. 
is there anything else I can do for you? I said, no, I think that's all for now. Thank you so much. He said, well, how would you like to come to my home for dinner tonight? Now I hear my mother's voice. Do not go to the home of strangers, especially strange men. I said, you know, I think I'm busy tonight. Thank you so much. I can't go. Okay, all right, another time. I'll call you tomorrow. So the next day I went out, I went in a different direction. Actually, I met other people, enough people that speak a little bit of English. I made friends. That was Monday, then Tuesday, then Wednesday, Thursday. I'm walking in different directions, meeting different people. Each day, Mr. Wong calls me up. Where are you? I say, I'm here. Just come quick. I've got your English, uh, your Chinese teacher here to meet you. And I went and met her. The next day he calls me up. Where are you? I'm here. Come quick. I've got the real estate agent to, to meet you. Okay, I go. Then on Thursday, I'm out with friends, new friends that I'm meeting. And Mr. Wong didn't call. And I thought, oh. I may not hear from him ever again. I have, because each day you see, he had been asking, please come to my home and have dinner with me. And each day I had said, sorry, I'm busy. So I thought, okay, I've said no enough times to him. He's not going to call me ever again. Friday morning, I go to a park. We had, go out for a picnic uh, all day in the South Mountain, mountain outside of Chongqing. And I spend the day with these two lovely ladies who I had met uh, previous days in that week. We get home. They drop me off in my neighborhood. They go on to their own home. I'm wandering around this shopping area by myself. I'm tired. I'm hungry. I can't go to my friend's home because she told me that night she has some students. And because her flat is very small, if I come in in the middle of her class, I will disrupt everything and they can't continue. So she had asked me not to come home before 10 o'clock. So there I am wandering around and I don't speak Chinese. I, I, I'm not going to go to McDonald's. I don't go to McDonald's here. So why should I go to McDonald's there? So I'm just wandering around. My phone rings, Mr. Huang. He says, are you busy? I said, no, not really. Oh, good. He says, come, we'll have dinner. So we met in front of the Xinhua bookstore and I follow him to his home. He opens the door, invites me in. Nobody is there. There are no cooking odors coming out of the kitchen. Nobody is there. Meanwhile, he's excitedly running around the room showing me all these beautiful paintings and calligraphy uh, covering the walls. And then he hands me a book and he says, see this book. And there it's a book with his photograph and his artwork. He's the artist. I go, oh, so this is I met somebody that, that may be a little bit important here. And so I get excited and I said, can I take pictures of your pictures? And he said, yes, 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 go ahead. But still I'm a little nervous because there's no, obviously there's no dinner here. But then he says, okay, now it's time to go for dinner. We walk down the hall to the, another apartment on the same floor and knock, knock, knock. And a woman and her two children answer the door. They've been expecting me all week, waiting for Mr. Huang to tell them that I'm going to come for dinner. The young girl is uh, uh, 15 years old. She knows five words of Chinese. We immediately make a heart-to-heart -heart connection. So we spend the evening with this young woman and her two children and other family and friends that they invited for this veritable banquet that they offered to me. But 10 o'clock comes around and I say, you know, I have to go. My friend is going to be waiting for me. And the woman, now all of everything is being translated. Mr. Huang is translating because nobody else speaks English. So the woman, as I'm trying to explain through Mr. Huang that I need to go, she goes into the other room, comes back with a key in her hand, hands me the key. And Mr. Huang is translating saying, she doesn't want you to go. She wants you to stay here with her and her family. She, we don't know who you are. We don't know why you're in China, but we think you're a good person. 
and we want you to stay here. I said, okay, I will. <laughs> so I did go to my friend's house. I got my jammies and I went back. Anyway, that started a lifelong friendship. They are family to me to this day. And this is one of the many, many reasons I fell in love with China and determined to stay there as long as I could. However, I did not have a plan. But through the help of Mr. Huang, and here he is on the extreme left, and the young 15-year-old girl in the white coat and her mother in the red jacket, and standing in a few pieces of his calligraphy at one of the big art museums in Chongqing. So I didn't have a plan. I didn't know Chinese, and, but I did go to the home of a stranger <laughs> and ha ha making friends with this family and they're embracing me as real, literally as a member of their family opened up many doors to me. And through the 11 and a half years that I spent in China, I met hundreds of people, made friends that are lifelong friends. And by the way, uh, I learned, I did eventually get a job as a teacher of English at a private school. And I learned while I was teaching there, because I used to give out my um, email address and say, students, you can call, you can email me anytime. And nobody emailed me. And then I found out, what are you, how do you communicate with each other? And they said, well, we have WeChat. And I said, okay, I'm getting WeChat. And once I started giving out my WeChat address, then my students would call me. <laughs> I was nobody until I got WeChat. Anyway, these are a few pictures of some of my friends in different places in Chongqing, up in the mountains, um, in uh, just amazing places and amazing people, which is why I'm in love with, with China. So what happened while I was there? Okay, I, I got by the first couple of years without learning. Well, I, I was picking up Chongqing Hua was what was happening. I mean, I could function, I could buy things, I could spend money. I could take taxis, I could ask for directions, I could make appointments to go places. Um, I could function in Chongqinghua. And then when I went to visit a friend in another city and I thought, oh, I could speak with these people in Chinese. Well, guess what? They didn't understand Chongqinghua. So I decided I needed to learn Mandarin. And that's when I enrolled in a university, Chuan uh, Wai in Chongqing to learn Mandarin. And again, this has just deepened my love for the language and the people of China. Uh, it's been a, a wonderful journey of getting to know because through language, then you can really start to understand what is in the minds and the hearts of people. This is what truly brings us together. It's not just words and, and sentences and grammar. It's really being able to communicate. Language is a tool for communication. And this was um, something that really was brought home to me in China. Now, Chinese, as our friend Dennis said, is not an easy language to learn. And just the same as going out to a new country and meeting people and having an open mind and an open heart helps you in those situations. It also helps you when you're learning a language. Don't get stuck on saying things or thinking things a certain way in a certain order. Be flexible. Very important for learning Chinese. Mm -hmm.